Good morning and welcome. I'm Raleigh Flynn, president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. As many of you know, FPRI's annual Templeton Lecture on Religion and World Affairs is a very special occasion for FPRI, not only because of the quality of these lectures and the wisdom dispensed, but because this annual lecture has become one of FPRI's enduring traditions. Founded in 1996 with a gift from the late John M. Templeton, Jr., MD, this will be our 24th annual Templeton Lecture. Uh, John Jack Templeton, who was president of the John Templeton Foundation, had a decades-long association with FPRI, serving as vice chair of FPRI's board of trustees and, along with his beloved wife, Pina Templeton, they provided critical support to FPRI for many, many years. We're deeply grateful to them both and to the Templeton family and the Psalm 103 Foundation for their ongoing support to FPRI and its mission. Simply put, FPRI would not be the robust institution it is today without their generous support. Past Templeton lectures have included last year's tour de force on religion, war, and politics in the 20th century and beyond by Pulitzer Prize winning historian, Dr. Walter McDougall, who's also chairman of FPRI's board of advisors and chair of our Center for the Study of America and the West, and who has had a long association with FPRI as well. I would also note Sadly, the recent passing of our 2013 Templeton lecturer, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. It was, in fact, Pina Templeton who introduced Rabbi Sachs to us, and during his lecture, he spoke very eloquently on the dignity of difference and the important of avo importance of avoiding conflict with those who are different from ourselves. It was an enduring message that's every bit as relevant today. This year, we're very fortunate to have with us as our Templeton lecturer, Dr. Zia Moral, who will explore the unique relationship between religion, identity, and politics, and how it shapes various conflicts around the world. Dr. Moral is a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London, which is based at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. He's a senior resident fellow at the Center for Historical Analysis and Conflict Research and the director of the Center on Religion and Global Affairs based in London and Beirut. He's also the author of How Violence Shapes Religion, Belief in Conflict in Africa and the Middle East, which was published in 2018. He's also a frequent com commentator in international and British media, including Al Jazeera, France 24, MSNBC, the BBC, the Financial Times, and the New York Times. So before we get started and I turn it over to Dr. Moral, I'd first like to take care of a few housekeeping notes. Um, we encourage you, as the lecture is uh, going on, to put your questions, any questions you might have, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Just click on it and you can add your question. Uh, don't put them in the chat box. Um, that will be used for, um, uh, for if you're having technical difficulties, you can communicate those with us. So, so do put your questions in. I would also say that uh, we will be recording this session, so you will be able to watch the video afterwards. We'll be sending that to you, usually within the first 24 hours it takes us to process that and get that out to you. Um, and finally, uh, I see many in the audience who are our members and supporters and board members, and thank you very much for being here today and for all your support. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Moral, who will be speaking for approximately 25 or 30 minutes, and then we'll go to some Q&A. Um, so take it away, Dr. Moral. Um. Thank you so much, Roly, um, for your kind introduction and thanks to the FBRI for the opportunity and Templeton family and the foundations have played a part in my journey as well too. So I'm actually an honored and, and, and thrilled to continue this lecture series. Um, normally I love engaging with all of you in person and I, I hate writing the text on my talks, but given the challenges that we face in the current pandemic, 
um, said they were doing this virtually and I've written the text on my talk for a change. So in addition to the video, you will, you will be able to dissect some of the very complex things I will throw at you over the next 25 minutes or so in your own pace and in your own home. So when I was writing um, my book on religion and conflict in Africa and the Middle East, I thought my conclusions and the direction that my thinking was taking me were, were quite heretical. <laughs> For so many years, you would have read and heard countless discussions on whether or not religions lead to violence. But my research on the ground, as well as professional and academic work in that space on um, regions and issues relating to religion conflict, was pointing to the opposite direction. I was witnessing that it was violence that leads to religion, and it was violence that alters and shapes religions, and that while religions bring unique characteristics to conflicts and terrorism, the nature of human violence, when and how it emerges, and what it seeks to achieve, was timeless. Um, as G.K. Chesterton once said, like every young boy, I wanted to find a heresy of my own, but when I put the last touches to it, I realized it was orthodoxy. In other words, in thinking that I was being heretical for seeing both religions and violence as intrinsic aspects of how Homo sapiens survived, adopted, and lived in a hostile planet, I was not saying something new, but only unmasking how heretical the public discussions on religion and violence and conflicts and politics have been in the West particularly since September 11 attacks. Now, decoding how and why we ended up in such heresies as common sense is not something I want to waste much time on, um, because doing so is accepting a debate, a direction of discussion and an inquiry and a horizon that almost always limits our imagination. It does not result in any other new insight or understanding, and far from providing any solutions, often results in demonization or alienation or relativization of the other who is different than us. You have all heard these arguments anyway. What are they? Well, deeply unsustainable theories of clash of civilizations that never seem to die, no matter how many times we dispute them and prove them not to be true. Romantic notions of science and education as the answer to it all, which both are truly important, but can't answer everything and can't solve everything that we see seducing language of essentialization that convinces you with hints that the other is always more violent, different, destructive, and spares you from a lot of uncomfortable questions and conversations we need to have about ourselves, our own identity, values, and religion, or beliefs. Or even the more scholarly airbrushing of religion out of issues we see today, which is a common, sadly, mistake to see, either by simply ignoring the topic or sidelining it as not the real issue like economy is or relativizing the content of religion in this conversation by simply noting that religions are utilized by political actors and agendas which are only true to the extent that religions in which are only true to the extent of what it is that they're affirming i.e that yes religions are often not the drivers of conflicts or politics as they seem to be and yes, political entrepreneurs, as well as religious entrepreneurs, seek to capitalize on religious language and appeals and networks, but ending the conversations there falls short in explaining why is it then such appeals work really effectively and religions have such a pervasive presence and that they matter to people and that people often actually believe in what they say they believe in and practice and live accordingly. So while it is tempting to not fall into the trap of popular discussions it is, and see other variables and mechanisms in play, it is also a mistake not to take religion seriously into consideration, study, and analysis of the world today. Let me offer another way, another line of reading these complex issues that we face. While accepting that every locality, every local political context, every local conflict have unique factors, and drivers and reasons for the way things unfold. Thus, it is often problematic to universalize discussions about religion and abstract religion into a nameless category, since religions do not exist in their own, but only in the lives of human beings. But there are also some overarching insights and threats we can observe across the world, now and in history. And hopefully these might give a basis to our discussions later on in this talk 
on the specific areas of interest to you if I know that area and if I can provide something new as an addition to the ongoing conversations. And firstly, I start with the observation that the ultimate drive of religions isn't about providing an individual a better life in the world to come and for the time being controlling them and keeping them moral but that it is about providing a meaning to a world that often does not make sense. It is about ascribing a story, a narrative to the reality that we're all subjected to, a reality that demands answers, explanations, providing guidance on how we should live as individuals and communities, where we belong and where we are heading to or should aspire to. You could argue that the quest to find a meaning, to find explanations and a path to steer through the chaos of being alive and living through confusing times as individuals and as nations is what has enabled us as species to survive, flourish, advance and create beyond bare necessities of survival. Taking religion out of such human drive often ends in an attempt to compensate religion by mimicking its role through another pervasive value system that explains the world, that shows us our place in it as individuals and anchors us in a communal vision and identity. If our starting point is what I just described above, then you can already start making sense of why is it that religions, religious language, religious ideologies, religious figures, narratives seem to be freshly relevant and widely consumed in today's world in plethora of ways, from re-emergence of white far-right extremism with Christian references in Europe and North America, to multiple forms of Islamism across the geography that where Muslims um, live, as well as religious nationalism across the world from Turkey to India, Russia, Hungary, United States, Iran, we are witnessing a phenomenon that is both old and new and both local and global. But we have been here before, we have seen this pattern before, sudden changes, fragmentation of certainties, ungoverned spaces, and the search for a moral order when every value system seems to be crumbling almost always leads to two things. One is enemy, and then two radical attempts to respond to that enemy. An enemy is the condition that emerge from collapse or disintegration of norms, standards, values, meanings, and explanations that ground individuals and cements communities. It is the in-between moment between the new and the old following tragic incidents, sudden luck or richness or poverty, loss of loved ones, wars, pandemics, abrupt political shifts. Emil Durkheim captured that word both in a study of the shifts in the labor force during the Industrial Revolution, but also in his study of suicide. He highlighted the link between the social and the economic changes and how they impact us as individuals, making enemy as personal as well as a societal issue. An enemy is a helpful concept to make sense of the milieu that we are living through now. All across the world, we see so many countries and communities trying to make sense and respond to sudden changes. Old narratives and visions that no longer bind us as societies, alliances are being strained our beliefs in motivations of friends and enemies alike have been found unsustainable. We are looking for lighthouses in the dark. Trajectory of national myths are broken and new visions set before us seem to be more divisive and destructive than unifying and edifying. New technologies only speed up the confusion, economic and social changes that we are witnessing. With an overwhelming exposure to domestic and global news, we are left numb, confused, and sticking to pre-held beliefs we hold about the world tighter and tighter every day. The difficulty of knowing what the truth of the matter is, whose solution is actually going to provide meaningful futures to us as individuals, as families and as societies, who will establish fairness for me, for people like me and protect me from the others that seem to be set to deny me a place, a voice, a future and equal ownership of the common space is a political as well as a personal challenge that captures so much of what we see and live. And this create, fuel, lead to radical attempts to regain control of reality. Anomi amplifies politics, identities, beliefs, ideologies, and that strange value we give to skin colors. 
the more precarious the conditions that you're thrown into, the more extreme your reactions and solutions and behaviors might be, the more differences between the groups are highlighted, and the more radical options available and amicable to you are. It is no surprise then that religion finds a comfortable and a well secure place in conditions of enemy. When faced with enemy, the world confronts us without a moral order of rights and wrongs, without rituals and taboos that are shared by a community, without a sacred that binds us together in that community, our politics seem to have lost direction, our understanding of ourselves in relation to the other crumbles. It results in xenophobia, scapegoating, attacks on religious minorities and migrants. It opens the door for the most extreme proposals and calls for a restoration of what is imagined to be have lost or a revolution to establish what was never there. Religion, religious language, justification, affiliation, not only serves as an effective boundary between us and the other, but it also promises a clarity and a foundation to restore, return, and rebuild on. That is why religions have easily adopted to both early 20th century nation-making visions, as well as revolutionary projects against nation states and or strong rulers in 1970s, and then in later 20th century, they adopted easily into international networks and visions enabled by globalization, and then lately to the movements and visions of that seek to undo the impact of globalization on particular societies. This is also why religions are intrinsic to violence. You could very well argue that violence lies at the heart of religions, not as something they promote, but as something they have emerged from in response to and in management of. From the violence of the nature that first religions sought to contain and respond to, to rituals like scapegoating or sacrifices that seek to divert violence and appease tensions between communities or between gods and us, from the sacrifice of the Messiah on the cross to appease the wrath of God and of the crowd, to the elaborate theologies of just war and jihad, and rituals of remembrance that maintain the losses of a community in a war and provide an eternal reference for the lives we lost in wars for very temporal aims, Thus, religions are present in modern militaries with chaplains, prayers, justification, as well as in militant groups and their management of excessive violence. Extreme experiences needs to be tamed, justified, processed, and when it comes to life and death issues and experiences of violence, of war, and conflicts, few can do so effectively that, as religion and beliefs with transcendental reference points. These already hint at how religions are not simply ideological beliefs held by individuals, but it is about human interaction, organization, participation, and communal formations. Religion is an eminently collective thing, as Emil Durkheim put it. We often do the mistake of seeing religion only as personal beliefs and ideology when we try to understand religion in other parts of the world, beyond North Europe and North America, but the evasive nature of religion goes beyond the privatized boxes we ascribe to it, even in Europe and North America. That is why you see it in ungoverned spaces and conflicts more clearly in attempts to establish law, order, welfare, governance, and an alternative order. So you see religion both in revolutionary visions to establish a new radical order in a given country, but you also see it in an attempt to build a state or a local authority in a failed state or ungoverned or contested spaces or serve in maintenance of diaspora communal identities far away from countries and cultures of origins. But in none of these, whether in meeting the challenge of anomie or violence, does religion act as an unmoved mover, as an unchanging independent force. Religion is as much a shaper as it is shaped by these events. God is our creator whose image we reflect as much as our creation who reflects our own image. Believers might very well believe in timeless truths of their religion, but what those truths mean, how those sacred texts are protected, read, interpreted, and applied across centuries and languages and geographies, make it all very human, very varied, and very difficult to maintain discussions on what might or might not be the essence of one religion or another, for sure. There are simple theological tenets that believers of a particular religion might share 
and repeat as plain truths shared by a billion people based on a sacred text. But the practice of that faith, its theological methods, burdens, and application show substantial differences. Thus, the term evangelical signifies substantial political and social connotations in the US, which is often not translatable to this side of the ocean to describe evangelicals, say, in the United Kingdom. Or while Islam has very easy to communicate pillars and practices, Islam is lived and expressed by a billion Muslims from West Africa to United Arab Emirates, from Pakistan to Bosnia, from Indonesia to Tunisia, have different local expressions and unique ways it accommodates local cultures, politics, and ethnic identities and agendas. So before we jump into specific issues that you might want to discuss, and I might be able to offer some perspectives depending on my knowledge of them, there are a few key takeaways from all these abstract points that I made so far, and I hope I haven't lost you along the way, um, or you're not watching Netflix while you're listening to me. Religions are alive and kicking. While their social and political significance might alter depending on developments in a given era or country, their place in the lives of human beings are consistent today as it has ever been. But religions, are far from independent factors shaping the way things unfold. They do not exist in a vacuum. They are as much products of their contexts as they are, are its influences. Given religion's capacity to provide meaning to experiences that demand explanations and a sense of order, it is no surprise to see them more visible in seasons of anomie and turbulence and conflict it is impossible to argue that there isn't a sense of any given religion, but for sure there are overarching beliefs and practices that brings believers of that religion together. Thus, religions are neither categorically promoters of peace or war, reconciliation or hatred, progression or a return to an imagined past. Within them, they carry powerful motivations, visions and mechanisms that can lead people to undertake truly brave steps to end conflicts, combat racism, protect their neighbors from pogroms and genocides, help those in need, advance science and knowledge, risk lives to bring aid and relief, pursue diplomacy to de-escalate emerging crises. In fact, the world is full of people of faith doing so, and I meet them every place I travel to in the world in every conflict and crisis and war I study. But the same potential and power of religion as described in the positive just now could also escalate and prolong conflicts, divide us, deny freedoms to others, demonize people of other religions or those of us who hold no religious beliefs, and while claiming to be charitable and merciful and just and ascribing a moral quality to only those, of pe those people who hold religious beliefs, they can actually demonstrate utmost cruelty, injustice, immorality, and hatred. And perhaps then we return to our own reflection on the mirror. The connection of the events out there in politics and global affairs with the very complex contentions between right and wrong, and honorable and shameful, meaningful and meaningless, inspiring and destroying undercurrents that we all have within us as individuals. And in the end of it all, religions do not exist, we do. This very human context should give us hope a hope that we might be able to find solutions to revert and contain some of the excesses associated with religions today, not by alienating those who believe, but by understanding their world better and working with them to address the problems that we're all facing in the 21st century. Um, I'll end here and then we can engage on the issues that you want to discuss. Thank you, Dr. Moral. That was a fascinating and certainly thought-provoking presentation. Um, I have a few questions uh, to get us started, and I'll also remind our audience they should put their questions in the Q&A. Um, so let's start with the issue that's on everybody's mind, the rise of COVID. It's, we, you know, it began in the spring and now once again they're spiking numbers and um even the hope in sight with a vaccine coming it may not get here in time so um i would ask you um thinking about religion and the pandemic and as you'll recall a religion and religious gatherings and religious 
choirs and such at the beginning of the pandemic turned out to be sort of the locus of some of the early super spreader events, sadly. Yeah. Um, not so much now, but um, what role can religion play in this pandemic that is affecting the entire world and doesn't see any boundaries? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think in some, com some countries like South Africa and a few other locations, even in the US, um, the data of how the virus spreads has demonstrated that particular religious gatherings where large number of people come into a close space in close proximity served as the spread of those viruses when other people were not. Um, but again, there hasn't been a clear picture. Um, even within the same religion, different congregations took a different attitude to it. Um, you know, I've seen um, Christian pastors promoting isolation and being careful and congregations moving to hold their services online in these type of conversations, repair and etc. Um, but also we have seen how faith organizations, you know, humanitarian groups driven by their faith, um, rushing to help countries and, and personally in, in medical services and, and responses and etc. Um, so again, we're coming back to other health crises we have seen in Africa as well, with Ebola, for example, um, and, and even some of the programs that have been run on HIV AIDS protection, where in so many of the countries that we think about, religious networks and institutions tends to be the most organized social force on the ground, right? They have the networks, they have the distribution channels, and they have credibility as um, people who matter in the locality. So when a priest or when an imam or um, when a doctor of sorts um, says, well, this is what we should do and this is the right thing to do, um, there's so many places where the people who share their values would follow them. And that might be my, way more effective than reaching to Instagram influences or, or Twitter campaigns and spending money. So you have seen World Health Organization, even State Department with their PEPFAR project, um, and governments that continually work with faith-based organizations and networks in promotion of public health concerns. Um, I think there's something about the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly in Europe and North America that caught us off guard. And unlike maybe in Asia, actually, some of the Asian countries have, been, have done much better than us in adhering to isolation rules, wearing masks, and, and really knowing how to respond and act responsibly. Um, to these things emerging because they already had experience with SARS and before and etc. So, um, so I think the religious conversations here are going to be really important, particularly with the vaccines on horizon. So the anti-vaccine um, uh, attitudes have really increased over the years. Some of them go back to sinister agendas by foreign states in promoting distrust um, and, and harming some particular brands of vaccines. We have seen these patterns before. Um, Russia has done some of these in Africa before that um, led to um, anti-vaccine outcomes um, and the trust towards um, some of these companies and, and, and medicines and vaccines have always been an issue. So I think while we are trying to establish, um, hopefully minimize the damage of distrust towards vaccinations and counter some of the misinformation, I think religious networks and actors with credibility with their own networks would play an important role to combat some of these. But they might also be undermining some of these as well um, because of their own politics or their own agendas. So how we engage with religious actors as governments, as civil society, um, is going to have, um, I think, important outcomes in management of the pandemic from now on. Thank you. Um, also looking at, at sort of what's going on currently, um, I, I'd like to ask your views on QAnon. Uh, the you know the um, some some experts have said QAnon really has sort of the contagion of a religious cult, um, and certainly there are while not a religion per se, there are some over or undertones of religion. There's uh, of course you know they, they're alleging there's a satanic cult uh, driving events and operating beneath the surface as well as there have been strains of anti-semitism throughout QAnon um, and you know what what I think was the hope of of you know this great internet of ours of being a force for for good and for humanitarianism um, QAnon maybe is one of the examples of the dark side. So um, 
Could you put that in the context of religion and have there historically been other entities like QAnon that in a, in a way used religion as, as a weapon to divide us and um, do harm? Yeah, I mean, so obviously from a social scientific kind of perspective, the words cult and religion say boundaries around them. Um, sometimes it's difficult, like in France, for example, the Church of Scientology faced a prolonged legal battle on being recognized as a religion or as a cult, because that word has a very significant meaning in France, and there are also some legal implications on what you can do, you cannot do as an organization. So those terms matter. Um, so when we speak about a cult, we often speak about a much more organized hierarchical structure that um, takes followers inside and makes leaving it extremely difficult or impossible and controls. So to that extent, uh, there might be cultic appeals in terms of how we use that word of close knit community and people's dedication to it. I think QAnon and everything that I could read about it strikes me as, um, as a fascinating expression of a particular moment in a society and politics that created certain sensitivities and certain cohorts looking again for a meaning to cling to an explanation just like what i said about the enemy and sudden changes and within which using modern technology to disperse what we already know as um, vulnerability of some people to believe in conspiracy theories as an explanation which are more complex than the truth <laughs> itself um, and they are much more elaborate and demanding cognitively than just the truth of the matter um, the problem with that is, of course, it undermines a society's cohesion, the place of truth in that society, and it has deadly outcomes. It directly links to um, attacks on individuals, attacks on minorities. And again, as I hinted in my, in my initial remarks, um, attacks on religious minorities and those of different skin color and religion and ethnic background as migrants in diaspora communities are a well-established pattern. So that's why you see anti-Semitism emerging in so many critical moments in European history again and again and again. Uh, we have seen actually attacks on Jews in Greece, in, in, in Hungary, in France for the last six, seven, eight years increasing and heading to a very worrying direction. And again, and in the United States, um, in so many places because of the differences of the Jewish culture, the language, the heritage, and the paranoia that has been, and the xenophobia that has been experts towards Jews and Soros and all these grand complex theories do have real life outcomes on um, lives of Jews in Europe and North America um, being contained and damaged and attacked and, and et cetera. Um, so I, I always take it as those anomic moments that trigger these type of networks. Now, the good thing is, um, if an if a, if a entity, a phenomenon like that, doesn't have a financial backer um, and an and organized direction, leaders and key figures, in other words, becomes a movement, not just an eruption of a trend, then it often is not sustainable. It burns itself, it consumes itself. It leaves a legacy, but it can be contained. The problem obviously for security services domestically and internationally is how do we find the dangerous individuals within that madness who might actually act on it and commit violence and harm our societies and our democracy. And that is the, the challenge for domestic and international security. Um, but I think in the long run, those uh, flares, if you like, uh, often are not sustainable. They linger in some corner of the dark web or the internet. But the wide attention they got at the moment has been worrying. And maybe with the changes in US politics and maybe with the tone of the next presidency and what the current presidency does in that transition, I think their impact might actually be minimized and contained. But the raw issue of people, not just in the United States, but globally um, giving heat to conspiracy theories, seeing Jews or secret cabals behind everything, um, and seeing the religiously different other as a threat, migrants, Muslims, people who wear headscarves, I think that has been a worrying trend um, and it always emerges under the same social and political crises. Um, I didn't see this question before I asked mine, but you have partly answered it, but I'm going to, to, to raise it from Don Carden, who's one of our board members and ardent supporters. Uh, discuss the role of religion in, in spreading and or, I think you talked about spreading, but combating conspiracy messages. Um, true, I mean, 
again, in so many countries, in so many places, and even in Europe, even in, in North America, you can argue that religion, the religious leaders, their publications, their meetings, tend to be one of the few places where people actually gather in large numbers and have this continual teaching and input beyond formal education years. Um, so in religion, you have a channel, a microphone that reaches to people that you might not be able to reach with written media. I mean, I can write elaborate books, but who's going to read them? <laughs> well, I can tell nobody from the sales of our books. Um, or in religious meetings, you're able to go beyond the wider audiences with simple messaging and credibility and plausibility of who you are and your message. They reach to a lot more people. Um, no matter, um, the, the world and all the studies have shown it, it's a deeply religious place in so many ways in so many places. Um, so whatever theory, whatever explanation the religious person um, influencer um, speaks to goes a long way because it comes across as not just something, something you read on a newspaper or in a commentator, even though the person itself is actually commenting, that's their own personal reading of the world, it comes across as an ultimate truth backed by an eternal truth, which is our God and our message. And the religious uh, clergy, whether it is an Islamist extremist or um, a, a, a far-right extremist with a religious term around it, or a Hindu nationalist, or a Buddhist monk marching um, um, in, in lynching of minorities in Myanmar, and etc. Um, their actions, their excesses are um, justified through a language of God is with us, and this is what God wants. And so therefore, all of our boundaries of right and wrong, maybe we shouldn't do this, is suspended in some sort of spiritual state of exception where boundaries collapse. Um, so then you can see a lot of excesses being justified. So in an Islamic theology of jihad, um, even hurting of another Muslim and innocent people are banned. I mean, the Quran is clear, Islamic theology is clear, but you see a lot of these jihadist networks of extremists having no problem whatsoever. Um, in fact, most of the time they hurt other Muslims, you know, not any of these kind of declared Satans out there that they claim to be fighting. Most of their victims are also Muslims and they justify it because they have a religious framework um, to ground their um, theories about how the world works and, and why the conditions in the Middle East and for Muslims in Africa and Asia, etc., are not ideal. Um, so you do see religious actors playing a larger than average role of any public figure, and their message tends, um, tends to sustain themselves a lot longer than just a commentator and opinion editorial. Uh, thank you. Uh, we now have a wealth of questions in our Q&A box, 14, so I will do our best to get through them. Uh, we have one from Carlos Rivers who asks if, uh, from a scientific point of view, there's a clear understanding of human nature, and shouldn't we focus more on a scientific approach of human contact and reality instead of ideological superstructures based on imagination to provide meaning? Yeah, I mean, I like the way your mind is heading, but my approach is more of descriptive. In other words, this is not necessarily the world that I want to see um, or I prescribe to. Hopefully, this is the world that I've observed in almost 20 years in Asia, in Africa, in Middle East, in Europe, and even in US, um, engaging with issues of relevance to this topic, religion, both in theology, but also from a social scientific perspective, from a policy and defense and security perspectives. So my understanding of how I see um, the human longing to find a meaning and order life of an individual and a community isn't necessarily um, what I think the way it should be. I mean, I would hope um, certain things work the other way, but sadly you see that. Um, there's a reason why Boko Haram, ISIS, Al-Shabaab emerged in particular geographies following particular sequence of events and appeal to particular people, maintain themselves, and then crumbled. And those patterns, again, are not um, what I would want to see. But I can understand um, when you are in certain conditions, um, you adopt and you respond, and certain belief systems and values provide you with that clarity. Um, so maybe if you look at it from a social science perspective, then our job is pretty much trying to understand that. And this is how it's happening, rather than actually pass a value judgment on what ought to be. Um, so what ought to be, what should be, is a different conversation. And that's when I should run for public office and then fail miserably. Thank you. Greg Bloomquist asks, are there some religions that resolve anomie ano better than others? If so, how do they do it? If not, is one religion as good as another? 
Yeah, I mean, I take it, so obviously the word religion is also very difficult. I mean, I kind of took the, um, the luxury of having limited time to offer such a broad stroke or an idea of a language of religion. Um, but belief systems that are able to appeal to um, beyond what you see here and now of politics, of your geography, of your body, of your individual immediate experiences tend to do better in explaining to you what it is that you're witnessing. Like, does this world have a meaning? I mean, people do ask what is the meaning of life, but the first question is, is there actually a meaning in life in, to this universe that we exist? I mean, or is everything out of control and if there's no sequence, there's no value. And if you follow Richard Dawkins's um, the selfish gene, the, you know, the entire existence is about the reproduction or the biological process with no immediate reasons beyond what you see, except what we make it to be. That's one explanation. And it appeals to people, but it doesn't appeal to as many as people as we think. And it doesn't necessarily enable a community to come together in an identity. This is who we are. This is our story as a nation. So you could say the vision of a nation state um, and ethnic separatism and a lot of other or communism, socialism, a lot of all consuming identities and ideological frameworks mimic religion in symbolism, in rituals, in language, in appeals to an eternal outcome beyond you and you go to die in the battle, you're dying for a nation and a story. In reality, it's only you dying as an individual and it's a policy decision and it's for your national interest. But we need to explain that and provide a meaning to your sacrifice beyond what it is that we're doing here and then. Um, so you could say that by all means, I think religions often are the most effective ways of meeting enemy. That's why even the most secular militaries in the world today use deeply religious language and chaplains and commemorations and justification. Um, but again, religion itself isn't necessarily an exclusive sterile thing you take out of a package. It includes all of that. And, and that's why I hinted in my talk that religion is shaped by its context, um, how it relates to one identity for example, in Russia, the Russian Orthodoxy, opening of a cathedral in Russia um, that almost included an icon of Putin and Russian military figures um, might come across to us as odd and strange, but from a narrative of Russian Orthodoxy and a universalization of Russian nationalism within such an overarching narrative is a very appealing um, look to the world and it provides Kremlin a chance to connect with Christian minorities in the Balkans, in the Baltics, in the Middle East, and position itself as a defender of the faith, while an outsider might very well turn around and say, well, hold on a second, yeah, putting you bombing hospitals in Syria is really compatible with monks blessing the same jets and tanks before they're deployed to Syria. Um, but you get to see that even in such a secular um, visions, religion is able to do what others are not able to do. Now, individual ways we cope with anomie are more complex. Relationships matter for us as human beings. Um, if you lose your spouse, if you lose your family, parents, um, and go through sudden richness or sudden poverty, have a medical issue, then you reconfigure, you have to reconfigure your life. You don't know who you are. You don't know what to continue for. You don't know how everything is going to unfold or when you have children or when you get married, all stages of life. We go through stages of anomie, which enables us to reconfigure who we are in relation with others in our new, new life. Um, but that individual process too needs to have a narrative, a value that sustains us about why things will be okay and there is hope. Um, and we find ways, we, in, in our own individual worldviews, there's a hodgepodge of things we patch together from Ofra, from um, Dr. Mehmet Oz, or wh whoever you're listening to as a guru. Um, there is some sort of value that we kind of patch together and then rebuild ourselves again in anomie. Um, but often it also contains transcendental references about right and about wrong, about hope, about um, a life to come maybe, or the, our loved ones still living. So religious themes and language are present even in the most secular sounding pop psychologies. Thank you. I'm gonna combine a couple of questions. Mohammed Bilal uh, comments, isn't it ironic that some in the West suffer from Islamophobia, but on the other hand, talk about religious harmony and secularization. And Hans Peter Sturm asks, if religion has the power of triggering both virtuous and destructive behavior, what determines how it tips in one direction or the other? 
Um, Hans, I think you asked the one million dollar worth question. I mean, if I could find that, brother, I'll be I'll be very wealthy and not be on this call uh, or be on a yacht sailing the world. Um, but look, I think we genuinely do not really know how and why at what point somebody goes from being a normal functioning person, gets radicalized, and at what stage do they lapse into violence and destruction and dominate the other? We're also not really clear on why is it that if you look at the Holocaust, for example, you, you needed a lot of people, not just Hitler, to kill six million Jews, right? It's very comfortable to talk about Hitler, not the millions of people needed to enable Hitler and his vision and to kill that many people. We also don't know why is it that majority of the people weren't acting like Schindler. Um, we did the movie about the righteous Gentiles who saved their Jewish neighbors, but there's a lot more who actually enabled Hitler, supported Hitler, kept quiet about it, um, even though they might have shared the same faith. In South Africa, for example, we talk a lot about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Desmond Tutu, very inspiring, but it's uncomfortable to talk about how the Dutch Reformed Church and other churches were part of the apartheid. In fact, that theologies to affirm that apartheid, slavery, um, and definitely um, Christian groups played a big part in, in stopping slavery, but a lot of I mean, if you go to, for example, in Ghana, there's a beautiful, I think, Portuguese compound, I forgot, in one of the slave trade outposts, and there's a chapel in the middle of it, right next to jails and really dark conditions where they kept slaves they bought and they stole from Africa. Um, and again, in Rwanda, during the, the, the genocide, you had nuns and priests that were found guilty at The Hague for partaking and supporting and killing in the genocide. So it is extremely difficult to kind of find the formula in Nigeria, when I was doing field research, I've seen amazing experiences of both imams and pastors alike standing at the entrance of towns and a bit like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings saying, thou shall not pass and stopping violence, stopping conflicts, protecting their neighbors. But again, to me, I don't know what is it that leads some people to risk their lives to protect their neighbors, no matter what creed, whatever faith or none they are, whatever skin color, ethnicity, what makes a lot of us, most of us, actually not do that and in fact partake in the aggression that to me is not a formula that we really know i wish there was a medicine to enable more of that but i think the context matters i think the influences i think personal anxiety psychological outlooks matter personal journeys but ultimately there's agency ultimately at some stage there's a decision for all of us to make so that's why i ended my talk with the kind of bitter recognition like alexander solzhenitsyn made that the line between good and evil passes through um, each of our hearts. Um, coming to the question on Islamophobia and in the West, I mean, it's an issue in Europe and North America. There's no way of going around it. Christianophobia and anti-Semitism is an issue in the Middle East and Asia in Muslim majority societies. I mean, so the, from the way I look at it, as someone who travels in all these geographies, have a sensitivity against all of these, we are facing a global problem, you know, um, of that demonizes the other. Either the other might be Muslim, the other might be Christian or an atheist, denies the other a chance to live freely and according to their conscience, which should be a human right under Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it is in pretty much every religion that your freedom of conscience is there in sacred text. But in reality, human behaviors see the other with a different way of living, different food, different clothing, different language in a different universe is a threat. Now in good times when economy is doing good and summer is going easy, those differences tend to be tolerated and lived. But if there's an economic downturn, political crisis, a war on horizon, sadly, religious minorities tend to be among the first to be picked on, to be seen as the cause of the plague or the pandemic or the the loss of the war or, or the economic downturn, there's always a reason because it's easy to pick up on a vulnerable minority that is not actually going to hurt you than it is to pick up on the system itself that has failed you as a society. Um, so to that extent, I don't think what we see as Islamophobia in Europe, which is a real issue, is void of its universal mimesis that you see in the Middle East as well too. And in Northern Europe, in, in Denmark and other places, and France as well too, the attempts to ban kosher food and halal food went hand in hand. So the attempts to um, deny or uh, stop circumcision um, affected both Jews and Muslims. So the attacks on anti-Semitic anti attacks have also overlapped with Islamophobia and actually um, the social tensions with Muslims and etc. Um, so sadly what we are seeing again is that global conjuncture where 
there are enough people in the public space that get good credit, good um, outcomes for themselves by poking hurts and differences and real issues rather than actually giving us solutions. And sadly, a lot of people seem to choose the comfortable way out by choosing the simple answer that tells you the other is always the problem, not you. Uh, we have a question from our board member, Jim Papada, asks, could you give us your thoughts on the intersectionality of racism, classism, and to what seems to be, thankfully, a diminishing homophobia on the one hand and white evangelicalism on the other. It seems that white evangelicalism has had a close relationship with these very negative categories of human behavior from its very inception centuries ago. And this relationship seems to have only grown closer in the last decade. And I think you could probably expand that beyond white evangelicalism, but I would... Um, Sure. Look, I think there's an old question. I mean, which, com which one comes first, race or racism? I, I'm, I'll humbly suggest racism comes first and then defines the properties of the other and creates the race. So race is not a biological category. Race is a sociological category. In other words, at a particular stage, following a particular social or religious process, there's a creation of a particular cohort of people and say, this is who they are right? Skin color tends to be easier to pick up. It's visible. That's biological, but not the value we gave to it. If you do a DNA test, then you realize all these racial constructs or purity is just impossible to even maintain itself in, in any legitimate scientific terms. Um, but what comes first is the exclusion and the drive to exclude the other that we see as shaking the moral order, which we think the universe has or should have. Um, just like on religious minorities in a moment of crisis, um, those with um, sexual orientations and identities that break away from that particular society's established taboos and norms often are the first ones to face um, persecution and exclusion, right? You've seen that even in the Holocaust. Um, you know, the first people to be killed were mentally handicapped. And again, I think um, gays and et cetera, before it even became um, Jews and specifically focused on that, the same machinery that wanted to do away with what it saw to be imperfections and impurities of this pure construct actually dealt with all of them as well, sexual differences as well as religious differences and et cetera. Um, so I see that again, an underlying anxiety by some people um, towards the other that is not like me and by its presence defiles and, and muddies the water that it shouldn't be. Now, if you start the world as a messy place, which I do, that is very difficult to carve out a neat uh, picture of. There are so many inconsistencies in the world and so many of us in this planet. And, and I don't see myself in the privileged position of dictating a homogenized playground within which um, everything I see as right and wrong is the norm. Um, I see the need to accommodate the differences and protect every individual and every community. And I'm not threatened by it unless they are denying me. Uh, my chance to breathe and live myself accordingly. Um, but then for others, uh, vision of a nation, vision of a community, um, vision of a race, vision of a pure society almost always creates a waste, right? Where there is design, there's a waste, as Zygmunt Bauman said. In other words, if you're designing a society um, with your own language of this is the right type of citizen, this is the right type of um, compatriot, this is the right type of American or a Turk or a French or a Brit or an Irishman or a woman. Um, and therefore, everybody else who doesn't fit into that is going to be a waste in that great design. You have no other option but to force them, assimilate them, keep them quiet as deviants, or basically you use that to mobilize everybody behind your vision, create um, taboos and monsters in your society and witches that you're hunting so that your society is continually on vigilance and this revolutionary process of following you and fighting against external and internal enemies. And that, um, the idea of friends and enemies at the intersection of politics as a main drive of political actors that wants to rally troops behind them remains to be same today. You've seen it in US politics, you've seen it in British, in European politics, you see it in Islamic countries. In, in, in everywhere, but you see it in Israel, you see it all around the world. Why? The other is a threat, and the only protection you have against the other is me. Vote for me, and I will make our nation great again, or uh, make Great Britain great again. We're leaving the European Union, and you see so many versions of this, because the other is a threat, just trust me. 
The problem is, of course, trust me, for the next three, four, five, ten years to solve problems that nobody really can and issues that is very difficult to do on your own, but you do need the same people that you're alienating, but it doesn't matter for an individual ambition. We're quickly running out of time and we have so many questions, but, but I can't resist asking the one from Yulia Brell, which is, you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture that the main purpose of religion was to help people come to terms with the outside world, with things they did not understand, could not explain and caused them suffering. Do you think there will be a time when humankind will not need any religions anymore? If yes, will people turn to something else instead? And what might be the substitute for religion be? Yeah, I mean, if you remember the experience of August Comte, I mean, he did say science was basically the answer, religion not, and it was very influential. And then he created a science cult religion with him himself as the priest and ceremonies and etc. So in other words, Every revolution tends to mimic the old regime that it's um, is claiming to be replacing. And any attempt to replace religion thus far um, in a society to ban it and to shape it always ended up mimicking religion um, one way or another, right? Um, and that's just the reality of it. So the content of religion, how it organizes, how it's expressed, how it holds communal and individual practices, I think changes. But if you look at how religions have adopted and survived 19th and 20th century, and again, as in my talk, I mentioned how in the early 20th century, there were fundamental aspects of nation making after the First World War. Um, and then gradually they became fundamental um, um, expressions of revolutions against the same nation states that they helped. Um, and you have seen a lot of um, popular uh, religious movements to challenge um, authoritarian rulers and obstruction. And in 1990s, you have seen international networks and globalization of religion um, that both resulted in charities, but also Islamist movements shaping the world in so many different ways. And then terrorism, that is a product of globalization. And then now you're seeing religious actors, practices, languages, shaping anti-globalization campaigns and politics and trying to create pure societies, again, that goes back to their heritage. So in all stages of 20th and 21st century, you have seen religions adopting, adjusting, and people really having no issue with believing in science as well as religion. And I, I, you know, I, I know a lot of scientists with profound religious faith, but it's just that it's Richard Dawkins that gets the media attention not necessarily them. So for me, by all means, as scientific knowledge expenses, um, we have a lot of gaps in our knowledge about the universe, about our bodies, about our life, and they will fill up, they'll be important, but there's an existential anxiety that lies in Homo sapiens that really does not change. One of the oldest um, written literatures that we have in any library is an art, not me, is a tablet from 1400 BC or 1500 BC called um, <clears throat> the dispute of a man who wants to contemplate suicide with his soul. So the dispute of a man with his soul on suicide or a, a tablet like that. Um, and the story is about a man in ancient Egypt who wants to commit suicide because he says people are not nice anymore. Everybody's obsessed about money and power. I don't have any friends. There's no reason to live. And he wants to commit suicide and his soul eventually convinces him not to because you, as a poor man, if you die now, then your funeral will be poor and in the world to come, my soul will resurrect under a poor condition. So all of a sudden you have a story that strikes me as really oddly, you know, well, I can hear a lot of people who say similar things today. Well, friends are not what they used to be. Morality is broken. Families are broken. And the uh, human process of finding who we are is really not changed by scientific advances in artificial intelligence and Twitter. All these existential questions of who am I? Um, how shall I live my life? Um, what does it mean to be a man, a woman, or whatever identity that I'm developing or I see myself part of? How do I live accordingly? And go through all the biological stages of human lifespan and all the questions that it asks raises a lot, of, a lot of things which are really similar. So you read your Bible, the Ecclesiastes, and, and then you're like, oh wow, how, that, this could have been written six months ago, <laughs> but it was written thousands of years ago. So I think there's an element where we have to hold in balance to say, look, um, definitely modern nation state has took the role of religion on, in the courts, in education, in health service. Imagine, remember the village vicar was all of it, you know, the judge, the doctor, the educator. 
Now, the state does it, but if you go to a court, the robes that they wear is suspiciously religious, and the finality of the justice we offer in the court sounds suspiciously religious as a practice, as a ceremony, not just a decision to put you in a cage for the next 10 years. There's a ceremony of it. Um, but at the core of it, with all the scientific developments, advancement to a modern nation state, religious institutions have still found a niche and a place in modern lives and adopted to it, became part of that machinery and are still providing public services and more than anything are still having followers to follow their guidance and live accordingly. Thank you. Um, we still have 14 open questions. Yeah. And um, so uh, you, you've talked a lot about these mysteries, but one thing that is not a mystery is that we'll have to have you back. <laughs> Where kind of you? Where kind of? Hopefully in person rather than in uh, Zoom. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moral, for really a fascinating talk and, and for answering so many of these, these questions. Um, I'd also, before we close, like to give a, a special, special thank you to the Templeton family, to the Psalm 103 Foundation for uh, your, your decades of support to FPRI, and to those of you in our audience who are supporters and members. Uh, for those of you who aren't, please come check us out, www.fpri.org. Con consider becoming a member and supporting us as well. Um, thank you again for all and a happy Thanksgiving to all of you and please stay safe. Take care. <laughs>